very familiar number. And I'll just show you these, these uh, this is data from Egypt. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what we show here is loan loss provisions, the amount taken for loan losses on, on the uh, y-axis, and operating profit, in other words, profit before taking the loan loss provisions off. Okay, so we have some black banks and some uh, square banks. Uh, some, yeah. The black banks all basically took loan loss provisions that were almost but not quite enough to wipe out their profits. So every year, this is for seven or eight years, every year they reported profits, but small profits, you know, reported millions and millions of uh, Egyptian pounds and everybody's really happy, but very small, essentially zero. This is a pattern of a bank that's doing upside down accounting. I'm not saying that Bank of Ireland are doing upside down accounting. They just happen to arrive at the same number, which is zero. <laughs> the one upside down accounting tells you what loan losses have we made. We have made exactly enough to keep us, you know, nobody would believe that we've made a profit. So we have a little huge loss of seven million. Anyway, okay, let's, let's uh, see what happens. All of those black banks actually have to be heavily recapitalized with uh, funds from my former employer. And so forth. The other, banks, the other banks were there to prove that it's not a pattern. It's only a pattern for banks that are in difficulty to do this. Okay, finally then we get to capital. Who knows? Really, this is the point. Nobody really knows. Some people say they know, and lots of people who provide comments on the Irish Economy blog seem to know, but I don't know how much capital, true capital, the banks have. They report, two main banks report, they've got 15 billion in equity capital. This is quite an important point. Because they are making that, they're making that statement that, that the capital is there, and that would be an issue if people are starting to come and saying, well, we're going to expropriate or something like that. That would be a number there that's going to be fought over in the courts. Now, the market obviously differs. Nothing new there relative to January. The lowest price, share prices were in March, early March. Um, and brokers are estimating that there are 16 billion in, in uh, loan losses not yet taken to book for, for those two uh, banks. For the, Loan loss over the period 2008 to 2010. That's the four brokers that came together to support. Now, the IMF actually says the situation is a lot worse if you take this famous 24 billion number. Because they're actually using this 24 billion is supposed to be net expected taxpayer losses. So that's after the shareholders have absorbed everything. So this is a rather big number. This is uh, getting up for 15, 16% of, of GDP in net fiscal costs. That's not just the amount the government has to borrow, because it's, it's, they're, not, they're never going to get that back if the IMF are right. Now, I've had a correspondence with my old pal, Dale Gray, who did these numbers. And unfortunately, he has not been able to explain fully the assumptions underlying his estimate. But I can tell you that it's just based on credit default swaps. Certain, the, the, the credit default swaps on, on Irish um, bank um, debt sometime in November it's not based on any particular knowledge or modeling of uh, loan losses in Irish banks. It's coming from a, a pure uh, extrapolation of, of market uh, data. Mark. So if the market knows something, and if he has made, if the assumptions he has made, and I can't really understand how he could make assumptions that would be credible, he hasn't been missing, uh, then you get 24 million. Now at the same time, having dissed the estimate, I, I'm not really <coughs> Uh, sure that this estimate is going to be all that far from. I, I, um, I think there's a huge range of uncertainty about this. We're gradually getting to insight as to the full scale of the problem. Obviously, the, the uh, state, the reported amount of capital doesn't correspond to an economic concept of capital. Uh, it, it smells to me, I suppose we'll like that, it smells to me like this situation might be a little better than the IMF estimate, and um, sort of central trend of my estimate. Could be a lot better, but maybe central estimate a little better than the IMF. Could be worse. I think it probably be a little bit a little better. But I think the fact that this range is so huge does influence the, the policies that can be adopted at this point more than that. We could get away with zero net fiscal cost. We still could get away with zero. Okay, let me move on to the I'm not doing very well for time. So we're now in the resolution and restructuring phase. So I pulled this chart out from a talk that I gave in a um, 
a public institution here five years ago when it seemed totally irrelevant. Uh, goals of the resolution and restructuring phase, allocation of losses, recovery of claims, the restoration of good management and sound financial structure. So that's, uh, that's what we're, uh, we're on about now. The main features here, and there are two, it's not just asset purchase, the main features, uh, the most high profile ones are financial restructuring, or if you like, recapitalization and asset purchase. These are separate issues. We gallop through this. Uh, I'll, well, I hardly need to say it. Recapitalization, I, I just want to stress that recapitalization is not delivered by asset purchase. Or if it is, you've done asset purchase very badly. Uh, sometimes asset purchase at too high prices is used as a covert way of recapitalizing. They did this in, in China. Uh, the government says it's not going to do this, but it could happen by accident if NAMA, the asset purchase agency, is too optimistic in its pricing. But this, I think, is the driving force behind uh, Carnes uh, and, 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 and uh, colleagues' uh, big push for nationalization because, a pre what I call a preemptive nationalization, because they're worried that this could happen by accident. Maybe some of the things by design, but I think by accident is, is the main feature. Um, let me also remind you from textbook approach that there are, there is a flow approach, <coughs> wait for banks to uh, make them retain profits over the years. I've mentioned how, how much reliance has been placed on this at present, and we know why this isn't, isn't good. Banks are zombies while it happens, they tie up all their resources keeping bad borrowers afloat, and they may take reckless gambles. There may never be enough profits, and it ends up costing you more. And then the good approach, the standard stop approach. It insists on aggressive, realistic asset valuations, reflecting true recoverable value of the assets. Insist on the banks raising new capital. And if they can't raise new capital, the regulator seizes control, finds the buyer for viable parts of the business, and puts the remainder to wind down in bankruptcy. And really, what we're around here is trying to find a mechanism for doing something like this because this you can do for a small two-bit American bank or even a fairly big American bank and they did it for fairly big American banks as recently as uh, September of last, of last year but it's not really feasible for the system as a whole particularly when there are few or no buyers out there. If this had happened just to us on our own and if there hadn't been a global financial crisis all right those banks would have been sold by now to big uh, international concerns, for sure. And that would be the neat solution. So if anybody says, why are we having all this nano, all this sprout concern? Because there ain't no buyers out there. Not for a whole bank anyway. Um, in the rapid disposal type in USA and Spain, people haven't talked about Spain, let's get the Spanish in. There have been disastrous failures in Mexico and the Philippines. Political pressures make these things come on stuff. Corporate restructuring type, famous case in Sweden, mixed experience in Finland, and in China, which is a big ongoing one, and obviously failure in Senegal and China. There is, I think, a gradient in the quality of the institutions. You see, the rich countries doing better. Are we a rich country? Yeah, we are a rich country. But will we do very well? Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> the percent of recovery is going to be very low, like 8%. I think the Chinese are getting up to about 20%. Duration can be very long. 10, 15 years was uh, an estimate provided by, uh, by Peter Bain. I think that's, that's right, could be longer. Uh, and, you know, questions of, uh, this is going to be a big entity if you have one of these. Now, now let me move to the international case. How am I doing? Oh, I'm at zero. Ah, well, then we won't be able to, um, uh, uh, we won't be able to go into a lot of detail. That's for sure. Uh, let me move on to, just very briefly then, give you uh, a picture of the different schemes, and you can all study them later on. Um, to my, yeah. A lot of you would have heard my great version too. I want to stress that the design features are enormously different between NAMA 1.0, the German bad bank case, the UK insurance example, <coughs> the Geithner plan, BPIP, a 
put in the Chinese AMCs because they're so big. All